Hello, gentlemen, ladies, and everyone in between. Welcome back to the Body Meets Mind show. Tommy, it's so good to have you here once again. How are you, sir? Man, I'm good. I'm, I'm taking your lead. You know, I'll, tell, I'll give you a brief story here. Uh, we've, we've done approximately 30 shows now, and, and every single time I see your head, I feel a little inferior because there's just a bit of a darker shade going on here. So I've tried to grow the beard, the beard out. But I've gone red, so <laughs> I've got a darker shade. Have you got a dark? You've got a darker shade. You've got a nice black. You've got a nice like growth on the chin there, and, I, and I've just gone red. I've just uh, wow. gone back to Ireland. <laughs> my, my Semitic genes are really it's beautiful through here. Oh, they certainly are, my friend. They certainly are. <laughs> <laughs> Look, t- Tommy. Today we've got a very special uh, man on the show. Uh, firstly, Stefan, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, we can't wait to to chat with you about so many different things, man. I'm excited. It's it's going to be a lot of fun. I am so sorry that I I don't have any beard game currently, <laughs> but it's okay. I think you guys are making up for it. But you got a nice polish, so we can't discount your uh, your chin there. Yeah, yeah, the beard polish is very very nice. The bullish, some call it. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to do a little intro for you, man. So everyone gets a bit of a sense of. Uh, who you are, all the incredible things you've done, and then we'll take it from there. So um, Dr. Stefan Zavlin is a a motion mentor driven to change desk work culture. Excuse me. Uh, Despite losing his vision in graduate school, Mm. Stefan hosts Scared Sitlips, an interactive virtual show. That's cool. It's one of a kind in his field to help companies adapt their culture and improve productivity and health. Since starting his company, Love to Move, he's written a book titled Sit Less and given a TEDx talk on the same subject, which is awesome, mind you. In his free time from being a dad, he likes to write songs on piano and guitar, critique a good cup of coffee and play yes. board games with his wife and friends. And Steph, let me tell you something. I'd love to be able to um, jam with you, play a little bit of music. And Tom, I think, has a sexual affair with coffee. So <laughs> I do. I do. Can definitely talk about coffee together. Don't tell my partner, but that is true. <laughs> <laughs> I've been slowly trying to convert my mother my, uh, w- once because I recently became a father, just as, just as you said. And uh, my mother came to visit and she thinks she likes coffee mm. and she drinks good coffee. And slowly but surely, she realized that we spend a lot more on coffee than she does for a better <laughs> cup of, uh, of Joe, a cup of brew. And uh, she spent about two months with us. She went back. First morning she's back, she sends me a text and says, you've ruined me. I now have to get better coffee. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. I, I think I spend a lot more on coffee than I do my children. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to do that. I wasn't even the one that got into coffee. That's the thing. I, I genuinely do have a sexual affair with coffee. My partner got me into coffee. Now, now I can't get off the stuff. <laughs> Funny you say sexual affair with coffee, which I brought up in, uh, initially. <laughs> Wait, has anyone ever tried coffee enemas? No. No. My parents have. Um, and that was that was an interesting experience at one point as a child to go, oh, I thought we were supposed to drink it. But uh, I guess that's that's the way that it is. I've never personally tried it, uh, but I'm I'm now curious why you brought it up. Yeah, exactly. That's right. I'm curious about that too. I've tried it. I've tried it uh, a number of times. It's obviously uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting experience. Logistically, everything involved in it was interesting. It probably does some good stuff for um, moving away from desk culture. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Which brings us to the top. Well, that was a nice segue. <laughs> it, is, it is rather before us. Uh, Stefan, I have had you on a, a previous show, which I just loved chatting with you about, um, uh, you know, the, the toxic nature of sitting and uh, all that comes with it. You've done so much since we've spoken last, including making a human being, which is really one, a, a wonderful thing. Amongst that, you've you, you've done this TED Talk. I'd love to talk a little bit about all the incredible things that you are doing with yourself and all the productive things you're doing with companies as well. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly touch on the TED Talk, uh, which has been, that, that is an interesting insight all in itself. Uh, because if you've never done a TED Talk, you don't realize everything that goes into it. And yes. after you've done one, all of a sudden you go, oh, I understand why they did it this specific way. 
so something I didn't know going into a TED Talk is it's entirely scripted. So I had to write about, I think I ended up writing 27 different scripts of this talk. Wow. Yeah. And you have to stick to the script when you're there. Like you submit the script to TED and they're watching you. You better not go off. No, it's not that bad. Uh, but you have to stay pretty close to your script no matter what you do. So almost every single gesture, every single move, scripted. Wow. Which then as you watch further TED Talks, you go, oh, I, I realize why they did that with their hand. That's a little mm. bit different. That's kind of interesting. As you mentioned, I lost my vision due to a parasite. We can absolutely get into all that. But during graduate school, I ended up finishing graduate school. But then over the next few years, I lost my vision. You both are wonderful, beautiful blurs with beards. Um, yes. <laughs> and, and so, but uh, that made another challenge for the talk, where it was most people could stand there and practice their talk with their script in hand and be able to speak it out. I mm. had to memorize that sucker way, way, way in advance. Wow. This allowed me to actually have a lot more of the movement that I was doing, which served really well to the fact that I'm actually talking about movement. Mm. Uh, and so ever since then, I, I also included a, a little dialogue in it where I get to play another character named Alice and we get to talk to each other on stage. All fun things, largely because I'm blind and I had to memorize so many things. So then I had so much time to play around with it. So wow. in that way, it was almost this like silver lining of bringing that uh, that forward. And it has been marvelously received because so many people find little snippets. And you think about it, you think how much information can you really get into 12 minutes? Mm. And it is it is so packed with information that when people come back to me and say, oh, this is what I remembered, I remember this. It's always something different and something mm. new. And I'll ask them about bits and pieces and they go, I don't even remember that part. Um, so it's That's it's cool. just packed with a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Uh it's wow. amazing. I, I actually just want to sit on um, the loss of vision that you that you've mm -hmm. experienced and how you've been able to turn something that for, for many people would be a debilitating uh, process and could potentially, you know, kind of be a handicap might be a, a strong strong word, but a handicap in life. But you you seem to have been able to find the bright side and actually turn it into a significant advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, so cool. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I will say that it's 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 a weird thing of where I was so supported and I always just thought that, oh, there's the solution. There's the next thing that I never really wallowed in all oh, the problems. And I think that by the time that it became more of a permanent because I got my vision back for a, a, about a year, maybe uh, almost. But then it, it, it went down and it was nerve damage and there was nothing to be done. But wow. I think it was that constant process of where I knew there was hope ahead that by the time it became permanent, I realized ah, there's still hope ahead. You just kind of have to find it. Mm. Have you used any like strategies for memorization and things like that to be able to, or is it just something that is just organically kind of developed within you? I, I have been blessed. And I don't know if this is just because I, I love doing it with a great short-term memory. Um, so, for example, if you ask me right now to recite the entirety of my TED Talk, I'd be like, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but I am able to memorize it really well in the short term. However, I will say that I practiced it for a month and a half before the actual talk, which it's really funny that we're speaking now. Um, the day of the recording, yesterday was the one-year anniversary of the TED Talk recording. It's not oh. like it came out, but it was the one-year anniversary. Oh, cool. Recording. Um, I practiced and rehearsed the talk four times every single day for a month and a half before the actual talk. Amazing. Bless my wife, because only after the actual talk did she come up to me and say, if you ever speak of that yeah. talk in our house again, I will, I will leave. I'll walk out. <laughs> because she had to listen to it over and over and over. Yeah. And over She's a doctor now. <laughs> right, basically. Yeah. So a lot of it was just pure repetition and just finding those ways. Uh, but I think I always had this kind of artistic little spark in me that that helped me memorize in that way and just great short-term memory. I'm uh, Steph, um, just a quick one before we kind of get into um, some of your work. Uh, was it, how, just, just with your, your personal journey, I have a mental health background, so kind of leaning down this area a bit. What was it like to, and be as vulnerable as you want, um, to, to have vision and then to lose it as opposed to being born um, blind? Yeah, that that's one that keeps on coming back because I'm this, you know, bright ray of sunshine um, and positivity most of the times. But there will be random, random, completely times where I'll just break down sobbing and just be mm. like, I can't see. I don't have the ability that other people have. 
the thing about it that inevitably happens in that kind of like, okay, what's the next mental step in, in, in mine is I'm going, okay, well, you're not going to fix it. I, just mm. nothing, I, I can't do anything. I could wallow um, and say, oh, no, I can't do it the way other people do it, or I can find a way. And that mm. sounds like, oh, great. All the advice everybody ever gives me, suck it up and just move on. <laughs> but I think it was for me that I could just chop it off and go, okay, but what's kind of what's the next step? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, not negating the feeling and still That's staying with, with that feeling and saying, let me feel this out. Let mm. me feel where it is. And then almost in a way saying, let me prove myself wrong. Mm. So because I, I would have said, I can never, I'm blind. Why, how could I ever give a TED talk? How could I ever stand up there and, and then do any of these things? And yet I do. How could I write, mm. how could a blind person write a book? But I did. Um, you know, like, so, so these various awesome. things of, of just kind of going, okay, but how about you figure out a way that you can actually do it? Uh, nevertheless, every now and again, I will still sometimes just kind of break down and these things will happen and just have to kind of accept it where it is mm. and find those little, uh, those little bits and pieces. But I, I think what, what I love about your story is that it speaks to um, the power of a form of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy. And I think when, when uh, an old aspect of ourselves dies, you know, be it because of some sort of traumatic injury or the death of a loved one, the, the grievance is is kind of the depression of having lost that person, you know, and just for everyone listening, you know, when you're going through something like that, you know, what the power of your story um, and the positivity that you bring is obvious um, is how that, that grief and that pain is always there. And I, I mean, I know this with injuries in my own life as, as well. Um, and, and it's important to feel those feelings, as you said, and, and grieve that pain whilst also getting excited by the hope and, and, and reorienting your life to so that there are goals that you can strive and achieve. Um, it's just, yeah, I just wanted to um, dive a little bit deeper in there because, you know, it's your, your positivity is amazing. You're like, oh, by the way, I'm blind. I'm like, well, hang on, you skipped over a big part there, mate. <laughs> so thank you. For, thank you for telling that. Sure. And I, if I may, I, I, I know that I kind of I still even there in that answer, I jumped over a lot of it there. There was that time again of where um, I had to put what I later found out was diluted bleach into my eye every single hour Whoa. for a month and a half. And when I say every single hour through the night, 24 hours, and it was three <sighs> drops to where for a month and a half, the max that I could get was 45 minutes of sleep um, mm. at any given time. So there was never actually like a full sleep cycle happening. Um, for a month and a half. The reason I say some of these things is that right now I've, I've repressed it. I'm sure there is a lot that I've repressed, a lot of pain that I haven't really dealt with um, in, in that sense. And maybe that's the defense mechanism. And maybe in the future, I will uncover it and a lot of trauma will come roaring out. <laughs> it's coming um, to the top. And I will go, yeah, guys, it's a lot more of me just crying all the time. And I can't <laughs> it. But even then, and this is maybe just my nature, as soon as it happened and I was going back to grad school, I started writing a stand-up comedy show about everything that happened to me. And I think it was just because I had this general outlook of, can I find the funny part in it? Mm. Coupled with that hope that I spoke about before. And then mm. obviously the support of my family. That was just, they, they came out, they stayed with me. It was, it was amazing. Well, it definitely, awesome. it sounds like a natural disposition or at least a disposition that you've groomed and you've, uh, you've harnessed and you've developed over the years and it's become who you are now. And sometimes, sometimes, you know, it's just great to just it, it be in the now and look to the future and not, yeah. not, not get too caught up with the, uh, with the whys and the, the, the past trauma associated with it because, Right now, the person that I see before me is somebody who's a very glass half full person um, that is loving life, which is and helping a crap load of people. So let's 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 hear about what it is that you're doing. This um, book that you've written and uh, also show that you've created as well. Sure. So uh, I wrote I wrote a book, and that's part part of the reason to be completely fair and honest is. If you ever get into the business and entrepreneur world, everybody basically goes, write a book. Um, everybody's out there, this is your new business card, write a book. So that yeah. was the initial thing of, hey, you should write a book. And I was going, okay, if I write a book, I, I can't just write a, a silly little book that's not going to be useful. I want to write something that is actually going to be useful and people could really take away. And it's not just a business card that has a little bit of value to it. I want it to be valuable. At the same time, I have this creative nature to me. I want to make things different. 
So, which you will hear more about with the show. Um, <laughs> so the way I created the book is I looked at it and I was like, okay, mine is going to be different. I know I have to tell a story. I know I have to give value. And then I know I have to give something else, something actionable. Mm. So the way I wrote the book is I split it up into where each chapter has three sections. There's a story and you follow the story of Alice, who appears in my TED Talk as well. Um, and the second part is, okay, here's just the actual mechanical things of if you want to just get down to the nitty gritty of this is what's good for my health. This is how many minutes of this I have to do. This is the kind of movement that I should do. And then the last bit is here are your three next steps that you need after this chapter. Mm. If you're the type of person who hates all the scientific stuff, you just read the first parts of all the chapters and the story of Alice, and it's all worked in there. So you can still learn a lot of the stuff. If you hate stories because you don't like fun or whatever your problem is, um, then you just read the scientific bits and there you go. And then whenever you want to revisit and go, what? I don't remember, what was it? You go back to the three next steps. So in that way, I wanted to create this book that could be used by different people differently. That's, this that's, led to me working on an audiobook version right now. Oh, cool. Now I have different people reading different parts of the book. We're, we're still in the works on it. And that way, it's now being developed differently. And so there's creative ways that we can help people with it. But in general, mm. the whole purpose of the book is not to get you to exercise more. Um, it is, as the title says, sit less. It is to get you to reduce the amount that we're sitting throughout the day. Love that. Mm. I love the the structure that you chose there. It's a choose your own adventure. For, it is. It's like goosebumps. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, man. How good would choose your own adventures? So good. <laughs> Um, that's, that's amazing. Well, well done, Stefan. And, uh, admittedly, I've not read the book, but I can't wait to, to dig in. I, I'm, I'm totally buying it and reading it. Um, I, I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy it. There's definitely some, some funny things in there. I, I put in a recipe for hash browns, um, which you never <laughs> expect to have in a book. No, I was going to say, <laughs> man, my, my wife is like, she's going to love you. Probably leave me for you. Your, your wife might have something to do, uh, say about that as well. <laughs> I don't have a beard. I don't think so. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like hash browns out her favorite, favorite, favorite. Some call her Mrs. Hash, which used to get her into a bit of trouble, unfortunately. Yeah, but yeah, uh... yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Steph, let's dive in uh, to to the book, and let's dive into why you've been so driven and passionate to actually create this change in culture when it comes to sitting. So initially, uh, when everything happened with my vision, I'll have to start it a little back and then because this kind of catapulted everything forward. I went back to physical therapy school. And one of the things that I loved about it is that we were practicing manual physical therapy, meaning all the hands on things, which when you're blind is fantastic because you still have the sense of touch and mm. feel and some would argue possibly even better than others where you get to feel it out and you're not relying on your eyes completely. Mm. So that led me to then practicing actually uh, once I got out of school and joining with an Australian uh, clinic, which were really heavy into the manual work. As I kept going, I realized more and more people were coming in that I would work on them and give them the exercises a year later, same issue, same issue, same issue. And one, they weren't doing the exercises, but we were treating a symptom at that point. We were treating the symptom of the pain or whatever else it might be. And the problem was that they were sitting, not moving. Maybe they had a monitor, so their head was turned in one direction for 12 hours a day, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So then when I left the clinic and said, okay, I need to start affecting this, I thought, oh, ergonomics is the way to go. And more and more as I looked into it, companies do that. Plenty of companies have an ergonomics team. They come in, they set your desk up, and then you don't hear from them for a year and a half or two years. Yep. There's not this consistent form of habits or whatever else it might be. And some people say, well, we don't have the money for standing desks or, you know, we just we don't have all the money for the, the treadmills and all those things. And so I said, OK, it has to be something simpler than this, because we're talking about just being healthy. You know, it, it, it doesn't take a lot. Yep. So it came down to figuring out that if I told people that they needed to sit less, most people immediately go, oh, you mean I need to exercise? That's the, mm, the habit switch that everybody thinks. They think we need to move more. And that was what kind of prompted the TED Talk of being called Move More, Sit Less to this point of, yes, you should move more technically. But it's not just about going out and exercising an extra hour. It's not just about uh, taking a, a meeting and going outside and walking. It's about implementing a lot of these things so that we reduce the total number of sitting. And they came down to one study, one study that just blew me away and I realized that had to be the answer. 
And that was where they looked at total sitting time. And effectively, if you keep going, if you look at it on, on a timeline, at about six hours of sitting per day, you've got an increased risk of anxiety and depression. Eight hours, you've got a doubled risk of cardiovascular disease. Wow. Which is big. But those are reversible with exercise. The big study was 11 or more hours of sitting per day increases your risk of premature death by 40%. Whoa. 40. Now, this is all, all different causes that could be the cardiovascular disease. It could be just muscle breakdown, diabetes, many different things. Yeah. But the catch was the risk was not reduced with exercise. Interesting. So if you're sitting and the global average is 12 in the U.S., it's anywhere from 13 to 15 hours for desk workers. If you're sitting 13, 14 hours a day, going to the gym for an hour, you're not getting under that 11 hours. Mm. And also, uh, you both will know, it's not as if your body goes, oh, just 10 hours and 59 minutes, you're good. <laughs> you're fine. You, it's you, true. <laughs> so there's kind of a realistic number we have to get under, and there's just no way we're going to go to the gym for three, four hours a day. We have to change the yeah. habits and the things we're doing generally. And that's what the book is meant to do. Uh, one of my favorite things that I put into the book that I, I, I forced myself to is that Alice, as the character, as the main character, fails repeatedly as she implements these things. Because mm -hmm. I hate reading those books that go, make this one habit change and your world is fixed. You're yes. a millionaire now. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. You fail, it's human, it's life. And so that, that was the big change is it's full of those little habits and things that we need to change in our work life so that our work style is reduced sitting. Yeah. You, you know, what? one thing I really took away from, from what you were saying there um, is that sometimes it's more powerful to mitigate negatives as opposed to implementing the positives. Mm. You know, we, we think about how doing more of something is going to get us to where we want to go. But actually, especially with that study that you just cited, um, not doing the things that are bad for us. And then forgetting about things that are good for us might actually have a better effect. Yeah. I, I love it. I love that that's the way that you said it. So one of the things that I talk about in my show, because I realized that this is a culture change that needs to happen. And not just not culture as in a society culture, but culture at work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I talk about is just this general concept of we think whenever we need to change a habit that we need to do more of the good instead of thinking of doing less of the bad. Mm. Um, and so, and then I played that. it for all the different things. So I'm like, we think that we need to eat more salads instead of saying that we need to eat less pizza. Yes. We think we need to be more productive instead of being less ineffective. That's one of my favorite mm. ones. Yeah. In an eight hour That's workday, awesome. at least in the US, eight hour workday, people work about four and a half hours. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that means three and a half hours, they're being ineffective. But instead, we're trying to squeeze more out of the four and a half instead of trying to make the three and a half less ineffective. Mm. Like, of course, you're getting burned out. Of course, it's it's harder and harder. What else can we change? Mm. And before anybody sends me a bunch of hate mail, I'm not saying we need to work eight hours straight. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just saying, again, this example of less of the bad instead of always more of the good. Yeah, I'm totally with you. And, you know, and sorry, Paul, I just want to make a quick note here. Um, um, I remember reading something about um, you know, they, they took like total productivity time of a whole bunch of CEOs, you know, and it was like the, the most like, you know, so a CEO might do like a 12 or a 14 hour day or something hectic, you know, but total productivity time was like three hours in that day. And you have to think about kind of the world we live in now where the assumption is like, even you just unpack it a little bit there, you know, um, eight hour day, my, 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 my unconscious system goes straight to, oh yeah, working eight hours. It's like, but we can't, I mean, I study uni, you know, 40 minutes is like a good, and then I, and then shit starts going haywire. I'm like, I need to have a break, you know, and obviously I don't have a break because I'm an idiot. I just have another coffee. So I do <laughs> the exact wrong thing that you're telling me not to do, you know, but uh, I think you're totally right. That's why I think I love that you're targeting the culture as opposed to the individual, because I think we get lost in these, socio these societal cultures and these environmental cultures and we think that we're the problem like perhaps i should be meditating more it's like well yes of course meditation is really good for you but when you've got a company who's investing billions of dollars to try me to try to keep me addicted to this thing what chance have i got so I, I love this as a cultural angle you know as opposed to try to do more that's awesome that's super cool and has there been any uh experience in your your life 
past as you were younger that kind of drove you towards this? Like how has this impacted you in your life as you've continued to learn about these um, productivity measures that you can actually apply to your own life? So a lot of this, and and this drives again this point of my kind of creativity that I, that I found in myself, is that I immediately said, how can I look at this differently? So many people are talking about movement and how important movement is, but we're not having a dent. Why is it? And so as I've started doing this, I've started implementing a lot of these things. So for example, right now, we're recording on Zoom. I'm standing. I stand for all of my Zoom calls, and I've made it easy on myself because my whole setup is meant for standing. Yeah. Um, it would actually take me more work to sit down for a Zoom because I'd have to readjust a lot of the stuff. Nice. So all of a sudden it's automatic and it's natural. And I thought, oh, okay, that's just like a little thing that I do because this is what I talk about. Um, and I'll do some of my other work. If I work on my phone, I put it on this tripod and then I usually stand um, and do some of these things. And so as I've been doing this over the couple of years, I didn't think it was having that much of an effect. And every now and again, I hurt my back. Yes, I'm a physical therapist. I hurt my back. <laughs> Um, the whole model is wrong. It's all, it's wrong right. Yeah. Uh, it used to be where I would hurt my back. Um, and this is usually hurt my back. I deadlifted and I went with an ego lift instead of an actual like, nice. don't, don't be stupid lift. And I would be like, I would be in pain for a week, maybe eight or nine days. Now I'm back to normal in two days. Wow. I'm not doing any extra exercises. Mm. I'm not doing anything. I literally just changed the amount that I was sitting. And all of a sudden, my healing time is that much faster. Mm. And I'm going, this is ridiculous. How, how did it improve this much? And I hate to say it, I injured my back again and again and again over the last several <laughs> years. And it, in two days, it was better. It was better. It was better. Wow. Not taking any medications, not doing anything serious or crazy. Yeah. And, and that's, that's been like one of the ways where I know that wasn't exactly kind of like a habit per se that, that fixed it, but that I noticed, oh, these things are so now. I view a lot of things in my life in terms of movement as, hey, this is just general health. So taking out the trash, this is great for me. Uh, sweeping the floors or uh, doing using the Swiffer afterwards, that's actually a little bit of cardio. That's good for me and my back. And so yeah. is doing the dishes. So now that's starting to shape my life in a very different way to where things I hate doing, which, yes, I also hate doing chores. Um, I think I'm only human in that. I find that pleasure of knowing this is for the benefit of my health and my body, not yeah. just the cleanliness of my house. And it changes your entire yeah. intention behind how you apply yourself to doing it as well. Like, you, you, I mean, you might not be sitting there going, I can't wait to do the dish. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> But, you know, you know, it reminds me of that study. Um, I forget the specific study, but it was surrounded around um, uh, a, a series of women who were, uh, they were housekeepers and they were, no, they weren't housekeepers. They were, they were maids for a hotel series. And they just did their job, right? They were changing sheets. They were cleaning bathrooms, all that kind of stuff. But once um, uh, the, the, the person that conducted the study started to educate them on how much they were doing and what benefit it had for their actual bodies and their minds as they were doing it, and only once they were educated by it, it started to have a profound, a profound impact on their physiology. Mm. Uh, their, their, their actual um, uh, their, their, their weight reduced significantly or as a result of actually just being aware of what they were doing and how they were doing it so the wow. the filter of having this kind of input into into your system and knowing that certain things are good for you creates that ability for you to be able to uh, i suppose have it with a little bit more of that glass half full and yeah. knowing that you have a positive intention behind it yeah, I, I love it. I, I think Tom will probably agree with this. It, it, it's, it's just the, the mind over body kind of that that clicking concept of it, um, I, I think, is, is, is huge. Because yeah. we would view chores as a stressor. We would view it as this negative thing, increased cortisol. All of a sudden, we're just going, oh, I hate this. This is so, my life is miserable because I have to change the bed sheets. To all of a sudden, oh, hey, I'm bettering my life by doing this. I'm uh, earning a paycheck that allows me to live a happy and wonderful, fulfilling life. And my body gets to move in these wondrous ways that other people don't. That's why mm. I'm going to have to start doing it even more now. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it speaks a lot to 
the meaning that we uh, ascribe to to what we do, you know. And I think um, that that when you are trying to create change within the individual and within the society, we have to dig a little bit deeper and change the meaning that we associate with with the things that we're trying to achieve. And I think, um, you know, I think that's why your creativity is probably going to really come in handy with this, you know, more so than it already has, because it gets people to change the way they see things, you know, like the, the, the way you were saying before, it's just like, oh, God, now I think I have to exercise more. But even for me, like I, I love to, I love to exercise. I love doing jujitsu. I love doing weightlifting. And even when you're saying something like, no, 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 forget about doing all the rehab stuff. Forget, forget about the foam roll. Forget about the massage. Just stand more, you know, or, or maybe even just hit a couch stretch as opposed to when you're sitting down. I mean, the ramifications that that's going to have for me as opposed as someone who loves to deadlift are, are massive and that's just changing my meaning. So already, mate, th- thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm. This is gonna. I'm gonna say something controversial. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. <laughs> I love it. Um, Morning. Morning. It, it's in. It's in the book. It's technically in the book, so I. I. It's fair. It's all fair game. So something <laughs> that I like to talk about is I think we have a, a poor priority in terms of movement. So most of the time when you go like, oh yeah, I love to move. I love to deadlift. I know everybody loves to deadlift. It's, it's the heavy thing. I love to strength train. And you ask a lot of different experts and they go like, what's the best workout that you can do? A lot of people go like, oh, it's going to be strength training. It's going to be the hit. It's going to be the high intensity, uh, the biggest bang for your buck. So I go at it in a very different approach. While those are good, if you're in a pinch, if you have very little time and you need to do something, yes, with all those caveats, I agree those are true. My hierarchy is very different. My number one thing that I think that everybody needs to be doing more of is move. Just move. don't think about what it is, mm-hmm. but you've got to move. The next part is the mobility flexibility part where most mm-hmm. people are lacking. Even people that go to the gym a lot, myself included, I hate mobility and flexibility. It's not as fun as hitting a PR and a deadlift. It's not. Um, only then would I say cardio. And some people still do cardio, right? But that's heart health. And most people don't even get that. And only after all of that, after you move plenty throughout the day, after you have good flexibility, good mobility, and you're actually taking care of your heart, then I would say you should worry about strength training. Because I think that we're getting to the point where we have a lot of people that go to the gym, think they're healthy because they just go to the gym for 30 minutes, an hour every single day. And that's all that it takes to maintain good health and good mobility. And by the time they get older, all of a sudden they can't move. And they're just going to be sitting on the couch further and further into the later decades of their life. Great hierarchy. Um, yeah. For those who are uh, inquiring, what what is your uh, emphasis on flexibility and mobility and what would be your reasoning behind that being uh, so high on the list? So p- part of it is simply because people don't do it. And the um, the, the way that I built my hierarchy was that If you are doing flexibility and mobility, which for those that may not necessarily know, mobility is the actual movement through that range of motion. Flexibility is gaining the range of motion um, for people who may not understand those those two differences. I actually didn't know that. That's cool. Oh, there you go. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So if you're doing that, you're moving. So technically, you're already achieving that upper kind of hierarchy thing. I always struggle with flexibility, mobility, and cardio in those senses just because uh, in the United States, cardiovascular disease, number one killer, even Mm -hmm. during the pandemic and with everything, it's Mm -hmm. still such a huge impact and heart health is important. But I think for longevity purposes, if you are consistently doing mobility, you're just going to be able to move and do all those things longer. And if people focus on cardio, then they might just do little shuffles and not as much kind of walking uh, and, and really using uh, all the body movements and joints that you that you need to. And mm. I think that is yeah. what leads to a lot of the injuries down the road later if they're not hitting the mobility and the flexibility enough. Mm. I love that. And that's playing the long-term game, which is unfortunately not what a lot of us think about. We're always yeah. We're we're always thinking about the short-term gains. So that's wonderful. Love that. And it also speaks to the evolutionary model. Like you, you know, your hierarchy, I think it's just so spot on because I think you know, as hunter gatherers, we you know we we walked most of the time. We squatted when we you know hung out and chilled and ate. We'd occasionally run to fight something and kill it, or run away from something. So that again, perfect perfect model. And then very occasionally, last on your list, we um, lift heavy things to build things. 
Yeah. So that makes so much sense to me. Yep. Yeah. Pretty pretty sound tight. You should be president. <laughs> hey, not a bad idea. <laughs> that's good. I like it. I know. That's this is great. Um, yeah. Look, wonderful, man. I, I, I'm loving this. Let's hear a little bit more about um, your scared sitless uh, show. I'd love to hear. That's bit. such a good title. It is cool. Thank you. It's very cool. Uh, uh, that one, that is where I, I really let my creativity completely fly. So I initially, because I was thinking, okay, I need to make a presentation, but I can't just make a normal presentation. Yeah. I would, I've sat through too many uh, presentations of um, over Zoom, especially of where it's just the boring reading of the PowerPoint. Uh, it's not engaging. It's not fun. And if you have another one of those where a person's reading something off to you and telling you, you should go and move. Uh, that's, that's not exciting in, in any way, shape or form. So I threw in all of my uh, wanting wanna be actor dreams and hopes into, into this show. And I, I said, you know what? It's my show. There's nobody, I'm not doing this uh, as part of somebody else's company or anything like that. Anything goes. And we'll just see what in the world I come up with. Mm. And what came out is, the reason I call it a show and not a presentation is because that's what it is. There's music that plays throughout the entirety of it. Um, at times, I completely leave the screen and you almost interact with another, like, I won't say who it is or what it is, but you interact with another being on the screen and you're almost having a dialogue with what in the world's happening. You get mm. to choose where the show goes. We talked about Choose Your Own Adventure. I was so glad I didn't bring it up and you guys brought it up <laughs> on your own. Some of the shows choose your own adventure and actually the outcome of the show is different depending on who chooses what. Wow. Uh, I play guitar in the show randomly. I'm not some mm. crazy musician, but you know, I because I feel there's so much we can do with this digital medium. And yeah. most companies, they go, oh, we just transfer everything through Zoom. So let's just do the same old boring PowerPoints on Zoom. And I go, yeah. no, there's so much more we can do and we don't need to spend a bunch of money on it. Um, and so I really got to put in a lot of fun stuff, a lot more humor and some of these things that the side movement are very much missing in the workplace for, for desk workers. Mm. So, so how does this work? You, you, um, you're engaged by a company and you participate in this uh, show, so to speak. And is it a one-off uh, kind of engagement that you, you'd you participate with all the uh, employees or team workers within the company? Yeah. So basically, so it's it's all virtual. Um, so they would they would join in and there's uh, various other little things usually because I have them do a tiny amount of homework and then there's a little bit of stuff that's interactive in the middle of the show as well. Like I said, then depending on the outcomes and all that. But yeah, usually a company just hires me on. I come on depending on how many people. That's how many shows we end up doing. Um, just because if you have 300, 400 people at once, they it may not be as good to do that or they may not all be able to attend. So then we might have to do two or three shows. But it is more of just a one-off show. You kind of get everything you need in it. And I even do some posing in it for um, nice. shots because I have people take screenshots because they go, hey, this is the takeaway. Here's your list. You don't have to jot down notes for this part. Go ahead and take it. Love it. <laughs> That's so cool. It's, not, it's nothing special. Sometimes I do the, the James Bond pose, but it, it depends. <laughs> it's not hey, I mean, there are some serial. I mean, we spoke about your polished chin before. There are some similarities there. <laughs> and, uh, and from what I understand, they're still looking for a new James Bond. Right. Or have they found Good. it? Can we start a petition? I'd love, sure. Stefan Bond. Bond. Stefan yeah, Bond. I don't think they've had a blind James Bond yet. That's true. Um, I don't know. His accuracy might suffer. That yeah, but, but we'll just change the game. That. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that whole target at the end, it might need to be a little bit bigger. Have to fix. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or you just see me fire completely in the opposite yeah. direction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, so Steph, let's, let's um, for people that um, um, don't know, you know, um, have all different sorts of fields, I think most of the culture is relatively aware that sitting for a long time um, isn't good for you. And obviously, you know, you've just... Um, spoken about a couple of um, um, studies which are really quite uh, alarming. But in terms of sitting down itself, what, so could you elaborate on what's going on in the physiology? Um, you mentioned anxiety as well. Why would sitting down um, perhaps change our breathing? You know, what, what's going on? Sure. Uh, there are a lot of really fascinating things. Um, what I will say before we dive into them, simply for anybody listening, is don't get freaked out. <laughs> as long as you just get up and move, most of the stuff gets resolved. So I just, I love putting that in because as soon as we get into the science, people hear the science words and they go, what, really? It's, it's okay. Yeah. So at about 20 minutes of sitting, because it starts as early as that, at about 20 minutes of sitting, 
the gene expression in the muscles starts to go towards muscle breakdown. This does not mean your muscles begin to break down. It simply means your body starts to possibly think about maybe breaking down muscle. That's, mm. that's all where we are. At 30 minutes, now you've got less blood flowing to the brain, which is now obviously going to have a cumulative effect affecting the anxiety and depression. Um, you're not going to be thinking necessarily as clearly. And then you're also actually having um, a reduced ability to metabolize fat for some people by up to wow. 90%, wow. which is huge. Yeah. Um, but it's not everybody, not everybody's 90%, but it could be up to that. So as you're sitting there, then you get up to an hour at, at about an hour of sitting straight, uh, for men, you're getting increased stiffness in the low back. So a lot of times when we, oh, we need to move a little bit more that happens then for women, it usually happens at about the two hour mark, anywhere between the one and the two hour mark. Interesting. And the one that really fascinated me, and this is especially important for any business and any workers and employees, and then especially the higher up in management that you go. At an hour and a half, you've got an increased uh, chance of errors, especially for creative tasks, by 50%. Oh, wow. Which also kind of baffles me. And the fix for all of this, by the way, is two minutes of movement. It doesn't, you don't need to go up and run a marathon or, you know, go for half an hour somewhere. Two minutes of movement reverses all of this. Mm. So now, a lot of people might hear that little timeline. Um, and then a lot of this goes further. So if you're the longer you're sitting, obviously it builds on itself. Uh, and they will say, oh, he said 20 minutes. He started at 20 minutes. That means we need to get up every 20 minutes. That's not feasible because if we get up every 20 minutes, you're going to completely break up your workflow. You're going to say, this guy's crazy. There's no way this is doable. I'm going to not do this. So if you're sitting usually for two hours or an hour and a half, start at an hour and 15, start at an hour, slowly work your way down. You may not get down to every 30 minutes and that's okay. It's just finding that time to kind of make it work. Mm. But that is what you're, you're fighting that whole time is reduce blood flow uh, to wow. the brain, a little bit of the muscle breakdown. Um, and then, yeah, just the ability to metabolize fat. Wow. Do you have any recommendations as to how to, to to break up that day? So let's say, you know, you, you want to get up every 30, 40 minutes. I know for me, like, you know, not everyone has their office set up like a like a gymnasium like myself, but like, you know, do you have any recommendations to people that are working either at home or in the office? Yeah. So I, I usually always give two things because this idea of getting up and moving for two minutes is more along those lines that we talked about before of move more. Mm, uh, it's, yep. it's not feasible. Because even if you broke up for an eight hour workday, if you every 30 minutes got up and moved, you're maybe adding 16 minutes total. That yeah. if you're sitting more yeah. at home and all of that, you're not really taking off a large chunk of that sitting time. So yes, you're reducing mm. the, the short term effects, but you're not really reducing some of the longer term effects necessarily. Mm. Also from personal experience, it just gets so annoying if you have a timer going off or something every 30 minutes and you're like, right. okay, I got to go move. I got to go move. Yeah. However, if you do that, um, the, the first suggestion is either get a timer or go by a task. So if you know a task is going to take anywhere from 28 to 35 minutes, great. As soon as you finish the task, you move. Mm. The important thing about the word move is that it's not the word exercise. Mm. The word move encompasses uh, anything. So yeah. if it's going and getting another cup of coffee, going to the restroom, doing something else where you have to get something from the printer, all of those things count. So you don't have to make it exercise. I had a list of exercises because I love doing stretches and exercises, but I'm a weirdo and that's okay for me. <laughs> um, so if you want to, you can, but after a while that gets annoying because you're thinking I'm adding more things for me to do. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That brings me to suggestion number two, which is really the, the one that you can scale almost infinitely. And that's changing what you're actually, how you're doing the actual work. So in my case, I gave the example of standing up for Zoom meetings. I don't have a standing desk. Mm -hmm. And part of me sometimes thinks I shouldn't get one just so I can keep saying this and telling people that they can do it without a standing desk. <laughs> I have a pile of my old uh, physical therapy textbooks that, that um, I have my computer on. Don't tell my professors. That's what they're being used for right now. That's, that's where they are. Maybe they'll forgive me because I'm blind. It's okay. Um, so, I, so I do all my calls standing up. That means if I sit down for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, and then I have a call, and then I sit down again, I now don't really have to worry about that. Nice. Getting up and doing the inverse. Stuff. Mm. Right. Maybe I have certain things where I go, okay, I'm now going to film some content because now that I'm a business owner, we're supposed to film content and mm -hmm. social media stuff. Yeah. I'll do that standing up. Great. So now my work 
parts of it, not all of it, I still sit, they become a standing. And that way, when I layer them and kind of alternate them, all of a sudden I'm breaking up my sitting throughout the day. And start super small. Start with a five or a 10 minute thing that you can easily do and then slowly morph how you're doing your work throughout the day. It, it, it all starts with awareness, right? Like so many yeah. aren't even aware of what, what is going on. Like, like if you got people to take an account of even, you know, like three days in a row of how, how much time they spend sitting, I don't think it would be unrealistic to think that people get out of bed, have a shower, hopefully, um, and, 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 you know, get into their, you know, have breakfast, get into their cars, go straight to their work, sit at their desk, literally probably 90% to 95% of the time, get back in their car, uh, sit down, have dinner and what, sit down on the couch and watch TV and stir and repeat. Like that's, that's a lot of sitting. And that's probably a, a significant portion of the developed nation and uh, the developed world, right? It is. I, I did a, in, in the TED talk, I did a quick little timeline of, of the amount that people are sitting and we I talked through in kind of that normal day and it's, it comes out to about 13 hours. And for anybody wondering, that's not including sleep. All right. So mm, then you're you're looking wow. at that. that. And I said, OK, if you're sleeping for eight hours, that means you're maybe moving for three hours out of the day of, mm. of that cumulative time. Um, and immediately we can't jump to saying, well, you got to get under those 11 hours. You got to get to 10 or nine hours of sitting. That's going to be very difficult. It's the equivalent, as you both know, if you're asking somebody to go work out, you don't start them with a full on, you're doing full body every single day for two hours straight. You, you can't jump to that. You start with something small that's doable and progressively work from there. But progress it's a long, long, long term game. Mm. Yep. Are there, progress, um, not perfection. progress, not perfection. Yeah. Are, are there, um, Obviously, every every individual is different. But when you're talking about um, starting small, are there small steps that you found within your work that apply to most of us? Yes, um, and this this is slightly individualized. But this has been for me not just in the sitting uh, last part, but in any single habit. The step that you should start with is the one that you go, "Oh, pff, I can do that." That, mm. that's the one you start with because yeah. most people even when they make it small they make it a little difficult so they might say oh instead of a, an hour workout i'm going to do 15 minutes okay i have to motivate myself to do 15 minutes i go start mm. with 30 seconds nice start. and they go 30 seconds yeah start with 30 seconds if if you go i can do that great you've at least did it you accomplished it and then you can keep going you go okay okay i can do a minute next time nice. and go from there that's going to be my biggest thing over all this time that i went wow that is really powerful Mm, um, that's the really other cool. one is, is that kind of building as well of some of these small steps. So a lot of times people go, put on your shoes and walk outside. Yeah, I think that's too many steps. I think some people will go, it's cold out there, or it's too hot out there, or it's <laughs> raining out there, or that dog's barking, and I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it might be. So I go, put on your shoes, walk up to the door, and then take your shoes off. Mm. Nope, don't, don't even go out there. You stop yourself. If you really want to, you can put your shoes back on and go out. And some people will go, that is ridiculous. Why is he making me do this? I'm just going to go for my walk. Mission accomplished. Hey, I'm totally. Right. <laughs> and, and whatever. Maybe you go, I put my shoes on. I open the door. I close the door. I take my shoes off. I go back to bed. That's okay. And add on and each step a little bit more, a little bit more until finally you get to this point where you go, it's just stupid for me to turn around. I'm yeah. <laughs> and then you're doing it. Those two have been. That's so cool. Deep. Yeah. That's really cool. I think Paulie and I spoke about um, something similar to that um, in the book Atomic Habits. Was that that was you and I, Paulie, wasn't it? Uh, uh, we had definitely talked about uh, Atomic Habits, breaking down habits into very very tangible steps that you can then you know essentially applying the laws of progressive overload, and that's what <laughs> right. you're discussing here. It's like yeah, start with you know, uh, start with a naked barbell, right? Yes. Your naked barbell is putting on your uh, your shoes and walking to the door. Add, totally. Add five pounds. Get outside the door. All of a sudden, you know, a year or two from then, you might be running a marathon. It's a PB. Well done. You know. Yeah. It takes time, but it's all the the, the the way I see it. The way you're explaining this, and the way I'm digesting it is the the primary. Um, 
the spotlight needs to be on the way our mind digests these right. as opposed to the way our bodies, the, or, or should I say, the benefits our bodies are receiving immediately because if we don't give it time for our minds to actually absorb this habit processing, then we're not going to have a long term. And we're, it's all about the long term. It's all mm. about sustainability. And it's all about us walking around the blocks when we're 70, 80, and 90, not just running a marathon or, you know, going for a run around the block for the next six months and then saying, I can't be bothered anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I also want to give, for those that might be on the higher and advanced level, um, something that I've struggled with is overtraining, uh, which I know some might go out and be like, myth doesn't exist. Doesn't <laughs> um, I, I would argue it, it, it depends. It depends on how, how you look at it. But I've definitely had times where I'm like, I didn't need to kill myself that much in the gym by any means. Mm. Um, and it's that part where you go, I don't want to do a workout today. I really just don't feel like doing a workout today. And it's having to determine, is that a, my body cannot, my body is injured, is in pain, is uh, actually has the muscle tissue broken down enough to where I should not do a workout today. Or my mind is telling me, like you were saying, my mind is fighting me and saying, I don't feel like it. Mm. And the way that I found the best way for me is start with five minutes of movement, whatever it might be. Mm. Because if it's my mind, just because of the way that the physiology works, the blood gets flowing, the endorphins get there. And all of a sudden, after those five minutes, I'm going, you know, I'm actually feeling pretty good. I'm feeling better. I'm going to go on and do the rest of my workout. But if my body isn't feeling good after those five minutes, my body really goes, can we please not? And mm-hmm. I go, okay, you're right. You shouldn't. Yeah, and that's, that's, really cool. that's, that's so spot on. Steph, I, I, I yeah. love uh, your approach to health. I love that you're kind of flipping the script on this as well. And you're, you're looking at it from new, fresh approaches. Thank you so much, dude, for coming on the show and talking about all the uh, the beautiful little uh, health nuggets that you're throwing out at us. And um, it's it's been a pleasure yet again. Pleasure on mine. Thank you both for having me. This was a blast. Steph, where can we find you? Uh, where can everybody find you out in uh, internet land? Out in internet land, stephanzavelin.com. And then pretty much on all the socials, except for Twitter, I being blind and typing all those things in, but <laughs> Instagram, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. I I post videos sometimes even twice a day about all this kind of various stuff. Right. Uh, Stefan Zavalin, all across. Awesome. Love that. Thank you so much. That, that was Beautiful. Great. My pleasure.